It was in fifth grade that the attacks became personal. My son Kyle was, and still is, an amazing kid, one who's sweet and smart and who rarely worries about what others see when they look at him. Those attributes, I know, will make him an amazing 35-year-old man one day, but when you're 10, they're a liability. Kyle found himself in the uncomfortable position of being teased mercilessly by this boy because he'd admit out loud that he actually liked math or that he didn't like soccer. When my husband and I tried to approach the teacher, his response was that by fifth grade, kids had to work these things out by themselves. Although many schools in the wake of Columbine have tried to initiate anti-bullying programs, most of them pay lip service to the concept without necessarily enforcing the practice. It's one thing to say that everyone has the right to be who they'd like to be, but that doesn't make it easier for the kid who is a little shyer, a little more hesitant, a little different, to get up and go to school in the morning, knowing that everyone's going to be staring at her and snickering behind her back. Adolescence is about fitting in, not standing out, and because of that, some kids become a moving target. I knew I wanted to write about what happened when a victim decided to take a stand. I also knew that the research I did for this book was going to be some of the most delicate research I'd ever done. When I was on book tour in Littleton, Colorado, and I mentioned that I was writing about a school shooting, the room got frighteningly quiet. Tragedies like that aren't something a community gets over. They get through them. I actually began my research there, contacting the sheriff's department that responded to the Columbine shootings. I spoke with one of the deputy sheriffs, who was quick to admit all the mistakes that were made. I also was given the opportunity to see video footage that wasn't released to the public, tapes made by the two high school shooters in which you could see the fine line between play and the deliberate intent to harm. But talking to the sheriffs wasn't going to be enough for me. I wanted to speak to someone who'd survived a school shooting. I happened to be in Minnesota doing an event when the Red Lake shooting occurred. It was one of the weirdest experiences I've had as a writer. I was in a hotel room, working on a chapter of 19 minutes, writing about a television reporter broadcasting information about my fictional school shooting. In the background of the hotel room, I had the television on, and suddenly a reporter filled the screen, broadcasting information about a real school shooting. I was still rattled when I did my bookstore reading later that evening, and I explained to the crowd what had happened. Afterward, a woman came up to me. I know someone who was involved in the Rokori High School shooting, she said. On September 24, 2003, a 15-year-old named Jason McLaughlin brought a loaded pistol to school and killed two students, Seth Bartell and Aaron Rollins. At the murder trial, it was claimed that McLaughlin intended to only wound Bartell, who he thought was teasing him. McLaughlin was sentenced to life in prison. The woman I met at my signing put me in touch with a young man whose friend was murdered that day. He was in the locker room, changing for gym class. Seth and Aaron, also in class, were already upstairs in the gym. He heard what sounded like books dropping and then people shouting, Aaron's been shot! Everybody get down! Everyone in the locker room thought it was a joke and came into the gym to find Aaron on the floor of the hallway, surrounded by teachers, yelling at them to get into the locker room and lock the door. This was 11.30. They sat in the locker room for two hours until witnesses were moved to the library to talk to police, but that didn't happen until about 5 p.m. Outside, helicopters could be heard, news vans were lined up on the street. This young man got on the Internet in the library. And that was how he learned that his friend Seth had been shot. He told me that this had been an ordinary fall day. There had been no indicators that something was going to go wrong. He told me later he realized that if he'd walked out of the locker room 20 seconds earlier, before Aaron, instead of just after him, he could have been the one shot. He told me that he didn't know the shooter, that the two victims were from different cliques at the school. Aaron was a hick, or someone who liked to hunt and fish, drive trucks, listen to classic rock or country music. Seth was a skater, part of the cool clique, and already the top snowboarder at the school by the time he was a freshman. He told me that he had no contact with friends after the shooting because his cell phone was in his car, locked down in the school parking lot. He doesn't like to talk about what happened with anyone who wasn't there, and says that the people who were already know, so there's nothing to talk about. This wasn't a murder on the street somewhere. This was a place he had to go back to, in a place he'd been led to think was safe. 
He remembered being angry at his parents, who tried to offer him comfort, as if it took something like the shooting for them to realize they needed to have a better relationship with him, as if the only reason they were being more attentive now was because the world was watching. He said there are new rules in place at the high school to prevent something like this from happening again, like locking doors after school starts or not having backpacks in class. But if the shooter's a student, he'd already be inside after school starts. And if you want to bring a gun in, you can hide it in a coat, a purse, a binder, or not bother to conceal it at all. I asked him what he'd say to the shooter if he could. He said, I guess I'd ask him why. Then I would tell him that I hate what he did, but I don't hate him, and just let him know that the lives he took meant so much to so many people, and that really three lives were lost in this tragedy. He also told me about going back to the school a few days after the shooting. He went to the spot where it had happened. At first, he couldn't see anything but Aaron lying on the floor. He forced himself to walk up to where Aaron had been. Then he and a friend sat down against the wall and cried. To this day, there are still chips in the wall from the gunshots. If not for this young man's honesty, the characters of Josie and Peter couldn't have been born, and talking to him validated what I already suspected. Just because a shooting hasn't happened yet in your hometown doesn't mean that it couldn't. Part of the problem is that paying lip service to differences between students isn't enough. On the day when a student art show is as vitally important to the pride of a school as the winning football team, when kids who place high in math meets are given the equivalent of varsity letters, well, that's when we might start to see some real change.